everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to the second day of the Highlights in Medicine Conference. I hope you all had a great time at your class parties last night. Uh, class of 2009 certainly did. We had a great barbecue before getting a little bit of rain on us. As you can see, we've moved over to the Leslie and Arian Dubay Theatre for today's lectures as they're endowed lectures brought to us today by individuals who generally see made substantial donations to the university, which enables the College of Medicine to bring in renowned speakers from across the globe. So our first lecture is the 15th annual Clara and Frank Gertler Lecture in Medicine, established by Dr. Bernard Gertler. This lecture is to relate to the current strategic direction of the College of Medicine and is linked to current health and medical trends. This year's honored Gertler Lecture is Melinda Richter. As Global Head of Johnson & Johnson Innovation, G-Labs, Melinda Richter fosters the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, external R&D engine, and supports the innovation community with a specific emphasis on Johnson & Johnson sectors, consumer and health tech, medical device and pharmaceuticals. Prior to joining J-Labs, Melinda Richter was a founder and CEO of Pre-Science International, an award-winning firm dedicated to accelerating research to the patient. Melinda founded Pre-Science after she had a medical emergency that left her questioning the efficiency and efficacy of the healthcare system. She holds a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Saskatchewan and an MBA from INSEAD in France. She is Vice Chair of the California Life Sciences Association, a board member of a Biotechnology Transfer Committee, the Texas Health Catalyst Advisory Panel, uh, and the Dell Medical School at the Provost Office of the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, the University of Toronto and Janssen Neuroscience Catalyst, and uh, the ASTAR uh, Strategic Advisory Panel. So thank you very much, Mr. Director. Thank you. All right. I love how we have a whole group of people here bunched in the middle and he said, oh, that's a medical school thing. And I said, oh, I get it because my nephews and my niece over here came to University of Saskatchewan. Some are in and they're in engineering and education. So this must be an engineering thing where you're like, peace out, we're on the si sidelines. Um, all right, so how many of you deal with um, investments and venture capital? A little bit? Yeah, very good. How many of you are entrepreneurs? I know there's a couple in here. Very good. And uh, how many of you have raised money of those who are venture capital dollars? There's a couple up there. All right, very good. Well, I was always curious to know what possessed investors to put big bucks behind an entrepreneur, right? There's a lot of risk associated with that, for with your money and with your credibility. And inevitably, they would say, beyond skills, knowledge, capabilities, and experience, the one thing, the one thing they were looking for was that ability of someone to walk through walls. That's a term they actually use, walk through walls. Because the road to doing something new is filled with many hurdles. There are disappointments, there are setbacks, there are sacrifices, and the only way you can plow through all of those and keep going to reach the finish line is if you're compelled by a powerful why. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? Why do you care? In fact, Mark Twain said, there are only two days that really matter in someone's life. The first is what? What do you think? What's the first most important day of your life? The day you were born. Wow, that shouldn't have been hard, people. We're going to have to warm things up here a little bit. Yes, the day that you were born and the second most important day of your life is? The day you know why. Oh, wow. It's the first time somebody's got that so fast. I usually get the first response is the day that you die. And no, 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 people, that's a very bad day. But... The day you figure out your why. Why are you here on this planet? What were you meant to do? Some people are born knowing exactly what they want to do. They want to be a policeman, a lawyer, a fireman. And some people have to go through something to understand their why. So I'd like to share my story with you the day I figured out my why. And it is the story of Johnson & Johnson Innovation J-Labs. So, my story starts here. That's me, I'm 26 years old. 
living and working in Beijing with a global telecoms company. Actually, you might know it or have known it, Nortel Networks. So I was living there in the 90s. I, I had originally been recruited by them out of college into a fast track program where you rotate in different roles, in different business units, in different geographies all over the world with the express intent to be a president one day. And so I started with them um, after I graduated from University of Saskatchewan, uh, from the College of Business. I uh, moved to Calgary, Alberta. Then I went to Toronto. Then I went to Raleigh, North Carolina. Then I went to London, England. And there I found myself in Beijing. I was at the end of my assignment. I was about to jet off to my next location. And I thought I had the world by the tail. I thought I had everything I wanted. I had a career trajectory, I was seeing the world, and I was making what I considered to be, at the time, a lot of money. And that was really important to me because I came from a very humble place. I was born at the end of a little dirt road in northern Saskatchewan in an 840 square foot house, and that has one and a half levels, so you can see how small that would have been. And I was born into this house with my family, which included my parents, there's me as a baby, my five brothers, two sisters, another sister was yet to come. Um, and this little house had no running water, no plumbing, and no electricity. So, as you might imagine, particularly in the winters, life could be quite challenging. So from the time I was a little girl, I was bound and determined I was going to change my story. I was not going to be poor anymore. And so here I was. I thought I had made it. And listen, I worked really hard to be there. So 24 hours after this picture was taken, I was walking through the woods. I was going to an educational conference, which was a big deal in China at the time in the 90s, at the International Beijing University, and I got bit by a bug. I didn't pay much attention to it. Until 24 hours later, I landed in the International Health Clinic. I wasn't feeling so hot. And 24 hours after that, I'll never forget this moment, the doctor came in and said, I am so sorry, but there's nothing more we can do for you, and you should call your family. And there's something about that conversation that happened in my head that night when I wasn't sure I was going to wake up the next day that changed me. And I was struck by the irony that here I was working in Beijing with a telecoms company. We were trying to figure out how to order sodas from the vending machine with our cell phones. And yet, I'm here in this hospital, and you cannot take a blood test and figure out what I have? How is it possible that all this money and press and talent is going over here to something that now seems so frivolous when a pretty basic human health care gap existed over here? And how could I have been working on this over here when my life depended on this over here? And I vowed that night that if I got the chance to stay here on this planet, that that's the story I would try to change. Not just my story, but the story for many other people. And that story was around healthcare and healthcare innovation to make it just as advanced, just as productive, just as sexy for the best talent and investors to get into. So, Clearly, I made it, and I kept my promise. I quit my job, and I moved to the home of biotech, San Francisco. And there, I realized, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to cure HIV, hepatitis C, cancer, but I was a very good business person. And I thought maybe if I could apply my business lens from the tech perspective to the life science industry, maybe I could see a problem that nobody else had seen before. And listen, once I started doing that, it became quite clear very quickly. So in the tech industry, you give a couple guys a couple computers and a couple hundred thousand dollars, and a couple years later, they can turn around and sell that to Microsoft, Yahoo, or Google for $200 million. Fast and easy, just like that. In the life science industry, it takes you at least a year to raise all of the millions of dollars you need to get your specialized facilities, your capital equipment, to get your permits and your licenses, to hire your specialized you know, scientific team, to get you your proof of concept, 
to get your financing. And then it takes you eight to 12 years to get a drug to market and billions of dollars. So from the outside looking in, from a tech perspective, I thought, who in their right mind would start a life science company? By the time you get it to market, if you ever do, you're so diluted that the only thing you make is a difference. And folks, that's not sustainable, right? Which investor would you rather be? The guy who put $500,000 into Instagram and sold it for a billion dollars two years later? Or the guy who puts 300, 400, 500 million dollars into a cancer company that has every likelihood of failing in phase two to be phase three and losing everything. So that's what I realized the problem we had to solve was we had to make it just as fast and easy and inexpensive to start a life science company as to start a tech company. Okay, so now I have the problem. What's the solution? Well, I decided to go back again to what I knew when I worked at Nortel, and that is every place I went to around the world with Nortel, I could land somewhere and get started really quickly, and I had about a year to two years to get a project and product up and running, and I could do that because there was specialized facilities, there was capital equipment, there was an operations team, there was a legal team, a marketing team, so all I had to do was focus on my project, and then I could get it up and running very quickly. So I thought, well, why can't I do that for early stage life sciences? Give early stage life sciences big company infrastructure so that all they had to do was focus on their science. So that's what I did. I went out and raised $6 million. I got my very first facility, 36,594 square feet, and that number will be forever imprinted in my brain because I used it in so many spreadsheets and so many contracts. I made half the space both common business areas for community, because I wanted to build a movement of people who were elite entrepreneurs focused on solving big problems in health. And I made the other half of the common space into a capital research space that everybody could use, filled with millions of dollars of equipment for pharma companies, biotech companies, consumer health companies, digital companies. Most companies would typically have to go out and raise venture financing to get access to equipment like that. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted them to have it there when they got started. I made the other half of the space into individual wet lab and dry lab and office modules so if somebody could come in at a university and get something as small as a five foot bench and put it on their credit card like they're starting a gym membership and have access to all of that equipment. They could get started in 24 hours very cheaply. I hired an operations team that could take care of all the day-to-day -day activities because it's a very technical field, so the companies could focus on the science. And I hired a business services team that can do everything from as basic but not inconsequential as help a, a scientist or an entrepreneur turn an idea into a company, give them access to all sorts of partners and services so they could grow and scale. Most importantly, I wanted to build capabilities in the community. I wanted business people to understand science and science people to understand business. And I wanted to introduce all of these people with great ideas to a whole funding network of people so that technology could find money and money could find technology. And within the first five years, we did really well. Right? Our companies raised over a billion dollars. In that period of time, that was quite remarkable. But more importantly than that, to me, the company said they were able to do in eight months what it had taken them four years to do before, right? Now we're starting to get to tech time in life sciences. So were we successful? Eh, so far, so good. Had we changed the, the scale of the healthcare innovation problem? Not by any stretch of the imagination. To do that, I would have to expand. So I decided I would open up another site in San Diego. So I went there, I pulled together a community of leaders, academics, venture capitalists, corporates, entrepreneurial organizations, and I said, what do you think, guys, would this work here? And up stood a team from Johnson & Johnson, and they said, absolutely, we want to do it with you. And I'd never seen in a big company, the same passion for the pursuit of patient solutions I had only seen in startups before. And so we realized that if we put our respective strengths together, 
their global scale and healthcare expertise and my entrepreneurial model for life science innovation that maybe maybe we could really change the industry and maybe we could make a massive impact for patients. And so we did, we created model 2.0 of what I did before in San Diego, California, and we called it J-Labs. And it worked so well in attracting some of the best and brightest minds and accelerating them to the market that we decided to expand all over North America. We have now 11 sites um, either open or announced in North America. Our most recent announcement we did is a J-Labs at Washington, D.C. We're doing this at the old Walter Reed Medical Campus where uh, it had been shut down and now we want to regentrify it back to its original purpose of doing care and research for healthcare innovation for the citizens of the U.S. and the world. We're doing this in partnership with the Children's National Health System. Um, you may not know this, actually many of you may, uh, that one of the biggest underserved patient populations are babies and children. And uh, for obvious reasons of risk, risk for parents to put their kids into clinical trials and risk for corporations to have some harm come to some of those little people. But we want to shine a brighter light on it and bring a bigger microphone to that need. And we also partnered with BARDA. BARDA is a counterterrorism counter unit of the United States. Uh, they form and look for to develop and accelerate to the market medical countermeasures to biological, radiological, nuclear, chemical attacks, in addition to pandemics and epidemics. And we have obviously a huge unmet need in this regard. So we're going to work together with them to find and accelerate innovations to the market that can protect all of us. And so that's what we're doing in Washington, D.C., but we're also over in Europe and Asia. We formed a J-Labs at our pharmaceutical headquarters in uh, Belgium, and we are actually off. My partner and I, Victor Caselli, we're off to uh, Shanghai Sunday morning to go open our big J-Labs over there in China. So why does this work so well? Oh, wait, one more thing. We do have also a recognition that there is innovation everywhere, not just in these major urban hubs, but really there are incredible people with amazing ideas that can solve big unmet medical needs all over the corners of the earth, and we want to reach them. So we have created what we call the quick fire challenges. These quick fire challenges are challenges we put out to the global innovation ecosystem, and we say, please, wherever you are, if you have a good idea, submit that idea or submit your solution, and you could win grant dollars. We've given away about $7 million of grant dollars in the last two, three years. You could win a, a mentor from J&J, &J, somebody who's expert in the space, and they'll work with you over the course of a year to develop your solution, your technology. And you can win residency at a J Labs of your choice anywhere around the world. So we do these quick fire challenges again to find the best solutions and to rapidly iterate on potential technologies that could make a massive impact for patients. But we also use it as a platform to highlight issues or people who are unsung heroes in this space who may need an extra helping hand to bring their insights to the market. I'll show you one of these particular groups of people that we feel are important to the innovation landscape. Nurses aren't just caregivers, they're innovators working to turn yesterday's problems into today's solutions. They don't stop at what they have to. They do what they know they should, always going above the call of duty, working to anticipate and solve problems before others know they're there. They're with patients every step of the way. That's why we're proud to support visionary nurses through the Johnson & Johnson Nurses Innovate Quick Fire Challenge Series. Because nurses change lives, and that changes everything. Apply at jlabs.tv slash nursing. So if you have a great idea, look on our website on the Quick Fire Challenges. We're constantly rolling out new challenges. We'd like to help you get it to market if you think it can make a difference. So how have we done so far? So back five years after we started, we had 
450 companies under our management. We're actually at about 550 now. Those companies have raised about $11.2 billion worth of deals, both financing and strategic partnerships. 25% uh, of these companies were in clinical trials. That's remarkable for a five-year time uh, frame. 26% of those companies were already in market. Again, phenomenal. And some of the things that are near and dear to my heart, 26% of our companies are women-led. That's compared to an industry average of 1%. 23% of our companies are minority-led. That's compared to an industry average of 8%. So when you put your time and your attention to a focus, it can really work. And so why has this worked so well? It's because it's done everything we wanted it to do. Allowed us to get these companies started quickly and easily without a lot of financing. It allows us to build these companies that are smart from the get-go, that become then venture-ready and partner-ready. It allows those companies, if they have a great idea, to get to a go-no-go -go decision quicker, right? Instead of spending 10 years into something and all that money and then having it fail, maybe we can find out in 10 months. And most importantly, it's a better bottom line for investors. Typically, an investor would put $10 million into a life science company that had a 10% chance of making it. And now in this model, they can fund 10 different companies with a million dollars each. One of them is sure to hit, and then they can continue to back that company. So it changes the dynamic of the investment model. And why does J&J care about this? Well, if you look at J&J's track record over time, about 50% of our revenues come from things that we found in the external world. And so it behooves us to find things early. And we want to attract the best and the brightest, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. And we want to get a chance to work with them in this model. So they get to know us, and we get to know them, the team and the technology. And then we, when we both decide it's the right thing to do, to have a relationship together, to have a partnership, we can create the best deal terms for that company. It's not always about dollars and cents. Usually when somebody's starting a company like this, it's because they have a personal mission, and they want to see it come to life. And they want to make sure all of their technologies have an equal time at the table. So we have done a number of deals, uh, 130 deals with those companies so far. And we can do all kinds of deals. We can do equity investment, which is a very traditional form of financing. We can do licenses. We can do collaborations. Or we can do very non-traditional kinds of deals. Let's say an entrepreneur is working on something that's so revolutionary, and they're really excited about it, and we're really excited about it. but. No one would put big dollars behind it because it's too risky, it's too revolutionary. And so instead, we might fund a proof of concept contract. Let's say it's three months, $100,000, no strings attached. The goal is just for us to all learn together, to get some data and determine what we should do together next. And that's a very big change in a market where it's very hard to get early stage dollars. So how does this model work? Let's bring it to life through a specific example. I'm going to talk to you about a story called Arcturus. This is a company born out of San Diego. It was started by two young guys, Joe and Pat. Joe and Pat were working for a bigger company in San Diego, and they, their dream for 15 years was to have a massive impact for patients. And the only way they thought they could do it is if they started a company, but who were they? They were just ordinary Joes, in fact. As I said, the CEO's name is Joe. And so they didn't think they could do it until we started doing these educational programs when J-Labs came to town. And every time they came to those classes, they sat at the front of the classroom scribbling notes. And before long, they believed they could do it too. So with $50,000 saved between the two of them, they quit their jobs and started a company. And they applied for residency at J-Labs. Now, we don't accept everybody. We want people who have that really special something, they have the power of why. They really care about what they're going to do, and they're going to walk through walls to get it done. So they had an RNAi technology platform that was focused on rare diseases. That wasn't in our strategic areas of interest, but we really loved that they thought they were going to get there. And actually, we don't care as long as you get to patient. 
we think, yeah, you're in. So we brought them in, and they thought they had uh, signed a license. They thought they had a deal for a, uh, a license for a technology when they came in. And two days after they arrived at JLabs, they realized that because it wasn't signed, the company also saw the value in it, and they pulled the license on them. So suddenly they had nothing. And then one of the guys had two young kids under five years old. So they came into my office, and they say, what do you do? And I gave them a traditional Saskatchewan kind of response, which is, well, you better get to work then and get in the lab and figure it out. And they did. And they created this amazing technology. And they said, well, now we need, a, we need some financing. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll hook you up with some coaching from our biotech center of excellence about how to get financing around this. And uh, our bio, biotech center of excellence folks said, listen, if you've got this kind of a data, and work plan, you know, we'll do a collaboration together. No money, no strings attached, but we'll be an independent party that evaluates the data and say if it really works or not. And if, it, if we say it does, we promise you you'll get venture capital dollars. And that's exactly what happened. We say it, said it worked. They got $13 million in financing. But we still needed to do a deal, right? We still needed to make this applicable in a disease area that could get to patients. So. I had these guys then present to our R&D leaders from across J&J. We're focused on neuroscience, cardiovascular, metabolics, oncology, immunology, and infectious disease vaccines on the therapeutic side. And when they presented, our head of R&D put up his hand in, of infectious diseases, put up his hand and said, oh my god, this is the missing technology I have been looking for for hepatitis B. And for those of you who know this space, you know that one of the challenges of this space is that there are thousands of variants of hepatitis B, and that's why we can't find something that works, because nothing modulates for all of those different varieties except for this platform. And as you may know, or not, hepatitis B is one of the 10 most deadliest, debilitating diseases in the world. And if you can figure that out, well, you can save, you can save a lot of lives. And so we did a multiple $100 million deal with this company. And they were really excited. And they came back to us and said, but Melinda, we really care about rare diseases. That's why we came here in the first place. And I said, I got gotcha. you. So we set them up with some of our other folks at J&J &J to see what rare disease areas this technology platform could be applied for and which companies were in that space. And so within six months, they ended up doing a $1.6 billion deal with Ultragenics for rare diseases. So from the time they quit their jobs, it was $50,000 saved between the two of them, lost their technology, created a technology, and did $2 billion worth of deals. That all happened in two and a half years. That was tech time in life sciences. Now these guys have IPO'd. They're doing multiple deals with many different companies across many different disease areas. These guys are making an impact, and they're still two very young guys. And that's the power of the model. Now, we wouldn't have been able to do all of this without a champion, a mentor, uh, who is very meaningful for me. And when you're doing change like this, it takes somebody to stand up with you and behind you. And my champion is our chief science officer of J&J. His name is Dr. Paul Stoffels. He started his career on the front lines of HIV uh, in Africa. Uh, so he served for many years there, had his family down there, four young kids. Um, and he turned into an innovator when one day his friend, who was also a doctor there, got HIV. And, uh, you know, at that time, HIV was a death sentence, and his friend had a four-year-old daughter and wanted to see her grow up. So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this disease. And so he went into the lab. He stopped being a doctor. He went into the lab, and he started putting cocktails together. And he was the very first person who stemmed the tide of HIV. He got it to stop progressing in his friend, came up with a cocktail that is one of the top three cocktails on the market for HIV. It's turned HIV from a descent to a chronic disease. And now we at J&J are working on a vaccine to make sure that people have the best possible chance of not getting it in the first place. So 
What does he say to us that motivates us all the time? He says this. To save one life is significant. To save millions of lives, now that's addictive. So come, get addicted with me. And that's our rallying cry for us to make a difference for all those patients out there. So now, you might look at this 20 minutes, 20 slides, and say, wow, Melinda, what a wild ride. That must have been such a great time. You were so successful. And I will tell you, back to the beginning, that over the course of 20 years of doing this, that there were many ups and downs. There were many sacrifices, disappointments, and setbacks, or as I like to say, a lot of whiskey and tears along the way. And there were moments when I was ready to give up, where it was just so hard. It, there are times when it was brutal, and I thought, there's just no way I can keep doing this. And then I would take myself back to that night, that night in my hospital room, where everybody had given up on me. And all I had left was to hope and to pray that someone out there was still fighting for me. And that's when I pick myself up, I dust myself off, and I keep on going. And I keep walking through those walls. So, now I ask you, why are you here? What are you doing that you care about so much that you're willing to walk through walls for? Right? And listen, it doesn't have to be big. It could be just something that you care about. It can be as big as finding cancer therapies for children. Right? There's such a big unmet need there. Or it can be making sure that seniors have access to health care the way they need it to work for them. Or it can be solving loneliness in your community. I was meeting with the Veterans Affairs group in the United States uh, a few days ago. And uh, they serve 22 million vets a year. Nine million actually get come into the facilities for care. And they have 20 vets a day that commit suicide. And listen, they said it's not post-traumatic stress from combat. The biggest issue they're dealing with is loneliness. You can make a real difference in your community by talking about loneliness. Or it can be as simple but as powerful as standing up for others whose voices aren't being heard. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as it's something that you care about, that you're willing to fight for, that you're willing to walk through walls for. And now doing that takes courage. Getting knocked down, getting back up. Not knocked down, getting back up, that's hard, right? But if you have the courage to do it, it will pay back in spades. There's a quote that goes something like this. Um, you say life expands or contracts in direct proportion to your courage. Let me say it again, it bears repeating. They say life expands or contracts in direct proportion to your courage. So I wish you courage. Courage to own the power of what you have to bring to the table. Yeah, you can, you, and you can be a global leader, or you can be a local leader and make an impact for so many people. To use your voice, just to stand up and say yes, or put something difficult on the table, or to ask a, a challenging question, and to never let anybody tell you no. Because it is possible for you to do. So I wish you courage. Thank you for having me here. It's been such a pleasure to come back home to Saskatchewan. See you. Thank you very much for that fantastic talk. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, I love the chat, please.
Let me see what we got. It's going to be maple syrup, isn't it? Oh, Saskatoon the cure. We're trying this later, guys. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I don't know if we have time for questions. Absolutely. I think we have you know ten minutes for questions. Yeah. Sorry, can you say that again a little louder? What do you do when you lost your why that you had? What do you do? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, well, yeah, you have to figure out how to get it back, right? For me, it's about going back to that night. I, when I go back to that night and I close my eyes and I remember how it felt, it gets me back there and it allows me to keep going. And then I, you know, there's things that I have to do sometimes to help me uh, with uh, the courage to go back to that. I know what it is, but it's hard to get going. And then I start with simple little things, like uh, last summer was a difficult summer for me, and, uh, and it wasn't working out, and you know, you just get, you get mo immobilized. So I decided to do uh, gratitude tours every day where I would go for a run. It wasn't about how far I went. It wasn't about how fast I went. It was about seeing beautiful things and taking pictures of them. And I would post them on Instagram. And every day, I would do my gratitude tour. And over the course of like 30 days, my mood shifted dramatically. Part of it is just how we feel. Um, and every time I would do it, I'd come back, and I would feel alive. And I feel like I could tackle those things again. So I think it's about thinking big, continuing to think big, but using little small steps along the way to help us get there. And to start with small steps, like when I started this, I just started with a simple little question. I didn't imagine I was going to build something big like this. I was just wanting to solve one little problem at a time. And sometimes we try to make things so big, I call it the ta-da effect, that nothing happens because it's so big and you, you get paralyzed and nothing's coming together all at the same time. So you just start with one small question at a time and you work on that. And you surround yourself with people who are going to you know, motivate you to get there. It, it's amazing how important it is, the people we surround ourselves with. Yeah, good question. Yes? question about how you got from your very small home with many people in that home to the University of Saskatchewan? Oh, hey, that's a good question. Um, so listen, throughout uh, high school, I was, I, I loved school and I didn't have to work very hard at it. Uh, that was good news. Uh, but I got involved in everything. I was involved in um, band and sports and uh, I had my own radio show and I had a newspaper column and uh, I, you know, yearbook, president of the, you know, school union. I just, I loved being out there and, uh, you know, I got noticed. I ended up working as a ministerial hack for the deputy premier of Saskatchewan for a few summers at college and uh, I got scholarships um, and, uh, you know, I was very fortunate in that regard. Um, and so I had a choice of all the universities to go to. I got accepted to a number of them, but, you know, I got scholarships to go here, and we didn't have very much, so that made the decision. Um, but I, I love, I still remember very fondly all of the programs that I took here. My very first year of college, uh, I was in the arts program, because I was actually going to go into law. And... Uh, my very first year, I remember those classes the most and the best. So history and English and psychology and and economics and uh, and so then I just worked on doing what I did very well, you know. And uh, I was always very engaged in the community. And I think being engaged in the community is a real important piece of life. Um, fantastic talk. Two questions. Number one, what small town was it that you're from? Second question, what where are you from one? originally? 
in northern Saskatchewan. Sorry, sorry. Say Where that. are you from? Uh, have you heard of Good Soil? Yeah. Who's heard of Good Soil? <laughs> oh my God! Somebody take a picture of this. <laughs> this has never happened. Uh, so yeah, so we were a little north of Good Soil. So um, you know, I was tell everybody would say, well, "Well, what was your address?" And I said, "Well, you hang a left at." like the first intersection off the highway out of Good Soil, and then you go around two curves over a bridge, turn right at the next intersection, and that's where I lived. Um, so yeah, it was, it was uh, very cold uh, up there. It was a small community, I think maybe 300 people, uh, all people who came from Europe from the war, who escaped during the war. So it was a very unusual kind of community as well. I think English was everybody's second language there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, second question, I think a lot of us stumble in our own little silos of medicine and, and there isn't a great connection between that medicine and and business world uh, and not everywhere has a J-Lab. Do you have any advice for us on how do we step past the silos to connect with those kind of people in the community? Yeah, you know, one of the reasons I think the conference that happened um, on Thursday was really important. It was bringing together a lot of the different stakeholders from the ecosystem because it's not just, yes, it's not just about the doctors and nurses. It's not just then about the payers either. So Saskatchewan Health Authority, not just about the investors. Uh, it's not just about the entrepreneurs, not just about science and research. It's about all of them and how they come together. And actually, I heard some very interesting presentations on this. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is trying to form these multidisciplinary teams. So you have multidisciplinary care teams. Uh, so I think there's more to come on that. But the most important thing that I think there is is to focus on an unmet need and have different people come together about how to solve that need. So that, at this conference, it started off with Troy and Rita telling the story of their daughter, Hannah, getting glioblastoma at 19 and the journey they went through to try to save her. And it's a remarkable story. I mean, it, I don't know, maybe it was a 45 minute talk. And uh, I mean, you couldn't help but cry through the whole thing. And just, um, amazing how had they had access to more knowledge and care, had the system been set up better for them, she could very well still be alive today. Um, and that is a tragedy, right? That is a tragedy that Hannah could have been a thriving, you know, 20 year old today had the system worked out differently, to your point. How do we start looking at patients like customers? Right? You're a customer. And think about your cell phone. What's the first thing you do in the morning? You reach for your cell phone. You get your email. See your text. Look at Instagram. Whatever your friend's been up to. And um, it's really easy. So the tech companies have said, how do we serve you? Right? How do we get you addicted to our technology? And wow, it works. How do we do the same in healthcare? How do we get it so people really care about their health, that they're as addicted to making their health the best it could be, as opposed to you know something you don't think about until you get sick. And listen, when you get sick, you get religion pretty fast. But then you realize, oh my god, it takes eight to 12 years to get a drug to market, and you don't have a drug for this? What have you guys been doing? But unless everybody gets involved and gets religion now, it may not be there for you. So I think in this case, we got to take these use cases. I'm going to call it a use case. It sounds very cold. but. Take Hannah's case, for example. Like, I would love to start Project Hannah or the Hannah Project, where we say, what happened to Hannah? What were all the fails along the way on Hannah's journey? And how do we need to fix those fails? And I promise you, there, there's probably about five to 10 good businesses in Hannah's story where we, people can make money on it and we can service our patients and make sure people live long and healthy lives. Um, so we need to get oriented around that. We need to start stop thinking that business is bad in healthcare. It's not. It helps us serve these purposes and these needs. And we need to start treating patients like customers. What's the best experience you can have so you stay healthy? Because nobody wants to get sick in the first place, right? They, that's a that's a fail of the system right there. If you get sick, system has failed. You know, how do we get people connected to their 
watch, telling them how their health is doing, being able to see if there's any anomaly in your health. So for example, we have a company called Analytics for Life. It takes um, a, a number of biophysical measurements of an individual and creates a 3D digital image of your heart. And it's, your heart there is beating on the screen like it's beating inside of you. And it closely then monitors the evolution of your heart as you evolve in your life. And it has an algorithm that allows this technology to pick up um, uh, the pre-symptoms of pulmonary hypertension. So you can find it three years in advance of when you would typically diagnose it, which when you are in today's world diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, you have seven to nine years left to live. With this technology, you can get on the medication right away and have a long and north normal healthy lifespan, right? That's remarkable. That's the kind of thing we should be focused on. And that's what we could do here in Saskatchewan. You have a closed system. What I mean by a closed system is you have a full system that's like one payer system, and you can get everybody's data. You can track that data over time. You can see what opportunities there are to solve you know, big business problems that are also health problems. You could certainly do that here. This is a great opportunity to do that. And you see that in small closed systems like Israel, Korea. Um, maybe they're starting to do it in the UK. But it is possible. Yeah. Good morning. I'm a grandma to a... A boy who's finished second year economics in McGill, he's on his way to maybe Wall Street. I don't know. And I don't understand money. I just spend it. And I'm retired. Right. Anyway, uh, I've also, in Saskatchewan, and well, my daughter's uh, one of these environmentalists and has been promoting, and I haven't read the book yet, so the last child in the woods, and trying to maintain some boreal forest here. And we have a... Uh, a contract or a non-contract about lumbering and from where you are in Dory Lake and North 24 <clears throat> 7 there's wood coming out of there and Aboriginal people can have a meeting with the ministers about a tract of land by the time the meetings done the woods gone so uh, they are trying to develop some awareness at Nest Creek Festival I don't know how much Saskatchewan you know now uh, to make the southerners aware of the northerners and to political thing, you say the government and tap on the shoulder says this needs to be reined in or we're going to run out of forest because it's going at the rate of Amazon destruction. And of course they have no money. So um, presumably, I don't know if people develop a hol an idea about something because, well, wood is wood and if you sell it, I suppose, fine, but it also is a carbon sink and all kinds of things. So I've said my thing and uh, it sounds like, uh, what did I describe you? You develop passion projects. Yeah, passion projects, that's right. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, listen, I always, I have that kind of a brain where I see business opportunities behind everything, so I believe there is one there. So put it out to the crowd. Listen, what I'm doing is leveraging the power of the crowd. I'm giving the power away to the crowd, and the crowd all over the world has capabilities to bear. So bring the power of the crowd. Uh, you know, there's a business opportunity there that can solve the problem, too. So connect with the right people who can get it out to the crowd, and I think you'll find something. Yeah. On, on the basis of gross domestic product, if you look at the efficiency of the U.S. healthcare system as compared to that of Canada and many other Western countries, the U.S. appears based on my view of the statistics, to lag significantly behind in terms of efficiency. Any comments on how that divide will be narrowed in the future? How that divide will be what? Narrowed. Oh. Where the U.S. is brought up to a level that reflects efficiency in yeah. many other Western countries. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is um, I think everybody in the U.S. would say that if they had to design it from scratch, this is not the system that they would have. The problem is you have an incredible fragmentation. You have many different payers. Um, 
And so you can't get economies of scale across the different payers. You can't see the data across the payer. So let's say, for example, we should all be interested in what we call world without disease. To get, you know, it's good that we come up with cures, but nobody ever wants to get sick in the first place. Back to what I was saying before, we want to have prevention of people getting sick. And then if by, you know, your unluckiness, you have a genetic code that predisposes you to certain diseases, right? There's that. In the US system, the way it works today, if a payer invests in prevention, but then that customer of theirs moves over to a different system, that money they've invested in prevention doesn't come back as a return to them. Uh, and so therefore, they don't invest in prevention. Uh, we don't target where the money is really creating no value. So yes, drugs are expensive, and everybody talks about how expensive drugs are, but yet if you go into the healthcare system, if you're hospitalized, there's no value really in that, but it's incredibly expensive. It's more expensive than drugs. Drugs cost 14 to 17% of the total budget. Um, and so we don't have a strategic vision that goes across all these different players because there's so many different players. Whereas if you're in, a, in Canada where you have a whole system network, now you can say, where can we create efficiencies that will have impact down the line? Um, so I don't know. I think it'll be difficult for the U.S. to get there. Uh, but that's where you're also finding other players, orthogonal players, coming to the table to try to solve some of the problem like Amazon, right? You may have read recently Amazon is getting into healthcare. They've partnered up with JP Morgan and uh, Warren Buffett. And uh, the recent thing they're doing is trying to um, get rid of PBMs. These guys are the middlemen between the, the pharmas and, and the patients and the pharmacies. And they make a ton of money off of the system and they provide no value to it. Uh, so Amazon said, we're gonna do something where we're gonna take the, take the medication and go straight to patients. So those are some of the things that I think will create the efficiencies in the market, but completely orthogonal from what you would think. Um, I, I actually would say the most efficient system I've seen right now is China. If you go online and find out about a system they have called We Doctor, that's something you could do here. I wouldn't suggest you necessarily have China do it. Uh, you should do it yourself so you can protect your data. But that's a remarkable system it's all online. They have regional hospitals that are all standardized in the care that they have. They have satellite. Uh, they have TVs where you can satellite into experts in the urban centers. And everything's online. All your data is there. You can pay from your phone. You can set up diagnostics and, and uh, meetings from your phone. It's a remarkable system. So that's where progress is going to happen is in closed systems like what you have here. So. You know, what you could do here in Saskatchewan can be a global leading way of doing healthcare. You just all have to come together as a community. And that's what's interesting about this. This is a small enough community, you all kind of know each other, that um, you could come together and say, this is what we want it to look like. What are we going to do to do it? What are the milestones to get there? And, and let's do it. Um, so, you know, look at models around the world. I say Korea, Israel. Um, I think are really